my name is uh, Oliver Fitzgerald. I'm um, based at University College Dublin. And um, one of the abstracts that I um, enjoyed listening to at the ULAR meeting recently was uh, presented by Laura Coates on the uh, control study. So the control, control study was addressing the question as to um, if you have a patient who's got um, persistent disease despite uh, treatment with methotrexate, is it best to uh, gradually increase the dose of methotrexate in order to gain control of the disease? Or is it a better option to add in adalimumab uh, at that point, an anti-TNF inhibitor? Um, so they had, um, it was a 16 week study. The uh, primary outcome measure was um, MDA um, and they uh, uh, started patients on either um, gradually increasing methotrexate up to the maximum toler tolerated dose or adding in adalimumab. So what they found was that um, adding in adalimumab uh, was a, a better option um, in terms of the numbers of patients that achieved MDA. Um, in addition, uh, the uh, side effect profile was slightly worse with increasing methotrexate, largely related to methotrexate, normal methotrexate related adverse events. Um, and the patients who were on adalimumab uh, overall did better um, in all of the measures that were used in the study. So what this tells us is that if you're adopting a treatment strategy for patients with psoriatic arthritis who have persistent disease already on treatment with methotrexate, that it's a better option to consider adding in a TNF rather than increasing the dose of methotrexate which I think is a, a useful lesson and something that um, can be applied easily in a clinical setting. Another abstract I enjoyed was in the same session uh, from David Simon and the George Schett group in Erlangen in Germany. Um, the Schett group have been focusing on um, bone changes that occur in patients with psoriatic arthritis and they have some very elegant uh, studies of um, uh, CTs uh, of the um, joints in patients with psoriatic arthritis that clearly appear to differentiate them from patients with rheumatoid arthritis. But in this study, what they were looking at were um, structural uh, bony changes that uh, occurred in patients with psoriasis, and they wondered whether the presence of such changes might be associated with the subsequent development of psoriatic arthritis. So they had, um, I believe, about 114, 15 patients with psoriasis who had some symptoms but no signs of psoriatic arthritis, and they did um, CT um, um, scans of their um, second and third MCP joints. And they identified uh, a number of patients who had these um, structural bony changes with what looked like enthesophytes um, uh, at the edges of the joints. And they looked to see whether these changes um, and also bone mineral density changes um, might be associated with the subsequent development of psoriasis. And the bottom line was, so with psoriatic arthritis, so the bottom line was the uh, the, these structural changes and the reduction in bone mineral density at the endothelial sites um, appear to be predictive of patients that would go on to develop psoriatic arthritis. They're certainly more frequently found in those who developed psoriatic arthritis during the roughly 18 months of follow-up. It, it's a small study, um, small numbers of patients and small numbers of patients develop psoriatic arthritis, but it's an interesting study and perhaps gives us some clues as to what we should be looking out for in our psoriatic arthritis, in our psoriasis patients who might develop psoriatic arthritis. So um, I think some lessons are, are potentially learned from these kind of studies. A further study that I found of interest at the ULAR meeting were, uh, was a study uh, presented by Daphne Gladman, which was a um, focusing on uh, biomarkers that were measured 
during the course of the phase two uh, filgotamib studies in patients with psoriatic arthritis. So filgotamib is a JAK1 inhibitor. And um, what they did was they took serum samples at various stages um, of follow-up in the filgotamib study and um, measured a number of, of different um, uh, biomarkers, including inflammatory cytokines uh, uh, and other uh, measures, uh, to look to see what, uh, what they might tell us about uh, the changes that were occurring in both uh, musculoskeletal disease and also in skin. Um, so, filgotinib uh, had, in the phase two study, um, shown uh, a good effect in terms of both ACO responses, but also uh, PASI uh, responses. Um, and what they showed was that there appeared to be a difference in which biomarkers correlated with musculoskeletal response and which biomarkers correlated with PASI, which I certainly thought was of interest. So the markers like uh, CRP, serum amyloid A, um, uh, appeared to uh, correlate with um, measures of uh, musculoskeletal disease, whereas um, IL-17 um, and other inflammatory cytokines appeared to be more um, related to uh, skin responses, um, which I certainly thought was of interest and perhaps not terribly surprising in that the IL-17 inhibitors are uh, so effective in terms of skin disease. Um, but nonetheless, I think it, it gave us some insight into uh, what these, uh, the mechanisms, I guess, uh, for um, uh, uh, treatments like JAK inhibitors um, may be affecting multiple um, biomarkers uh, within the uh, disease uh, spectrum. So interesting. So the final abstract I wanted to mention was um, one presented by um, Ian McGuinness, um, president of ULAR, who uh, presented data from a study, the EXCEED study, uh, which uh, was a comparison of secukinumab and adalimumab in patients uh, with psoriatic arthritis. Um, the dose of secukinumab that was used was uh, 300 milligrams. Um, and that was compared with uh, the usual standard 40 milligram dose of adalimumab. Um, there were about 425 patients in each arm. And uh, the the primary outcome measure was superiority of uh, secukinumab uh, as compared to adalimumab. So, interestingly, um, the secukinumab failed to meet the uh, primary outcome measure. It was not um, superior to adalimumab. It looked about the same, both at the time of the primary outcome measure, but also in terms of more longer-term follow-up. Didn't appear to be any difference to adalimumab. Um, unsurprisingly, secukinumab outperformed adalimumab in, in relation to skin responses. Um, and while the um, while Ian McGuinness su suggested that there was some difference in terms of uh, some of the musculoskeletal measures in favor of secukinumab, but it looked really that there wasn't a whole lot of difference between the two. Um, I guess what that's telling us is that uh, secukinumab and adalimumab are about the same for patients with psoriatic arthritis in terms of musculoskeletal involvement, but if you have bad skin disease, uh, secukinumab uh, does appear to perform better. I guess. Um, my interest in this would be, you know, um, how do we know, is it, is it the same patients that are responding to secukinumab, the same type of patients that are responding to secukinumab and adalimumab? How do we choose which patients should go on which drug? And we still really don't know, um, uh, you know, other than if they've got bad skin disease, we really don't know which, which treatment to choose. And there's more, more work to be done in that area, certainly.
Thank you.